This is Mark Bushala, and you're listening to the Matt Balakor Podcast. Hello, good people out there. Thank you once again for tuning into the Matt Balaker podcast. It makes my day. And if you want to get a gold star in my book, please encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share this program. Uh, we, we're lucky in that we've had an impressive variety of guests on the show. But today's guest has a very important message that, that I hold dearly. If you're going to invest, why not pick fun industries? Uh, this guy today has movie star looks and a rock star portfolio. He's an entrepreneur with extensive experience in real estate, marketing, media, food, and beverage. He founded MAB Capital Management, a private equity firm, and was CEO of Angels Envy Bourbon. Please join me in welcoming Mark Bouchala to the program. How are you doing, Mark? I'm great, Matt. How are you? I'm well, and I'm excited to have another Chicagoan on the program. And I asked your friend, uh, Ron Diamond, a similar question, and I'd like to get your take, Mark. If people are visiting you know, the fine city of Chicago for, say, a, a weekend or so, other than deep dish pizza, what food items do you recommend they try? Oh, wow. It's a, if you're starting with a hardball question. Or you, <laughs> or you get jumping right we in. Go, we go right to it. This isn't CNN. Yeah. I, don't, I don't throw out softballs. All right. Well, I, obviously, I'm biased because I have some restaurants in my portfolio, so I would have to pick the kind of food that we <laughs> serve. Um, I opened a place called Untitled, which is a, um, a Prohibition era supper club in Chicago, and um, so the, the the cuisine it tends to um, skew American. Um, big bourbon selection, obviously. We've got about a thousand different varieties of American whiskey. And uh, everything from, you know, steaks to pasta and, you know, a good hearty Chicago type of cuisine. Yeah, it's it's not the time for, you know, lemongrass shakes and, and vegan fare. I think if you're going to Chicago, do it up, have fun. You can exercise when you get home. That's uh, right. Do you have a favorite Prohibition era cocktail, Mark? Oh, well, I, I, I do like an old fashioned and a Manhattan, I gotta say. Um, but I, I celebrate every kind of cocktail. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and at home, I'm too lazy to make one myself. So I, I will just generally pour some bourbon on the rocks. Keep, keep it simple. Uh, you know, you no, no need to complicate a good beverage. And you know, you're, you're worldly. And I'd love to get your take on what do you think are the, the top Two or three John Hughes movies, Mark. Oh, geez. We're going deep into Chicago lore today. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about finance stuff. When people really care about movies, food, and booze. I've, I've done my research. Yeah, I, I have to think on that one for a little while. Um, but I know he shot quite a few of them in my old neighborhood. I grew up in Iowa. Yeah. So okay, yeah. Ferris Bueller's Days Off is kind of, you know, Chicago is on front and center there. And, and it was in my backyard, yeah. So my, my, by the way, it's aged gracefully. It's still a good film. Oh, it's still a great film. And, and I, I know it, it might not be super high on Rotten Tomatoes, but my kids adore Home Alone. And, and I mean, it's, I don't know, it's been, I guess, 30 years or so. And uh, every Christmas season, they, they bust it out. So John Hughes, you know, he, he had a pretty good career. Yeah, I mean, I think child abandonment's always entertaining. <laughs> and as I'm now that I'm a parent, I just think it's funnier and funnier. So. Yeah, I guess exactly. You appreciate the humor there, right? <laughs> I, I do. So you have a like a, a really eclectic background, and I, I'm curious, Mark, um, how did you get into investing? Um, I was one of those weird students that I think from the time I was 15, I had an idea of what I wanted to do in life which was not work for someone else. So okay. um, <laughs> I, I began my professional career in real estate and um, basically doing adaptive reuse. Um, fancy way of saying I, I find a really crappy building and try to make it nicer and, and um, converting warehouses into uh, residential units. And just fell in love with that process because it was creative. Um, there was a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then you got to go to the next thing. So uh, I, I really began my professional career in, in, in real estate. That took me to um, an opportunity to go to Eastern Europe when the wall fell. 
And uh, that's kind of spiraled into lots of other ventures. Yeah, I want to hear about that because uh, my my mother's a, a World War II refugee. She, her family's from, she calls it the old country, but it's Yugoslavia. And I remember in the early 90s, um, after the you know the wall fell, I visited family you know that I'd never seen, and it was it was it was eye opening. You know, it was a wonderful experience. But I was there a few weeks. You went to Poland, I believe, right in Warsaw. I, I was based there. Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, around. please, please tell us about that because I think you spent more time uh, in, in Eastern Europe than I did. Yeah, uh, probably. I went for a what was supposed to be about a six month uh, fact finding mission there uh, with a Chicago development firm called Golub and Company, and that uh, turned into about ten years of living in country. <laughs> so, and needless to say, I enjoyed it. Um, there was tremendous opportunity and um, it, developing real estate in in a country where the idea of, of free ownership of land was um, eradicated for the better part of a century uh, was was tricky. That, that you bring up a good point, yeah, because on one hand, you can have new laws that say, all right, people are, are able to own property, but then practically speaking, it can take sometimes generations for, for that to kick in. I mean, what was it like? I mean, you, you, were, you, you were there. I mean, how, how did people adapt to being property owners? Uh, it was a long and kind of arduous process. I mean, if you if you found somebody who owned land, you weren't necessarily sure if they always owned it. If it was, if it was, <laughs> you know, it was a little bit. I've had it for six and a half hours. It's good. Like my name's right. on this contract. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the notion of title insurance wasn't there. I mean, you, there was a lot of inherent risk in, in any kind of development deal. Um, but uh, even stuff that the state owned, and the state owned just about everything at the time, um, very often it was stuff that was taken from previous generations. So the, the complications of the, the, the ownership was just the tip of the iceberg, of course, because then you had to get into the process of designing and building um, using, let's say, state-of-the-art Western technologies in a market that didn't have them. Um, it was it was interesting. Put it that way. It sounds I, interesting. <laughs> it was. I think it would help to be there when I was, you know, early twenties because um, the fact that everything was broken didn't seem to bother me too much. I thought it was actually more fun. And uh, the people that got parachuted in um, that were, you know, kind of mid career just pulled their hair out and got them. <laughs> you know. so, so, whose decision was it to send you to Poland? I think I was the only expendable person in the company. And uh, <laughs> like, what do we have to lose? Let's just uh, buy him a one-way ticket. And if he lives, he lives. It's six months. It's a decade, whatever. So who's Five counting? minutes, six months, we'll see. So what are some of the big takeaways you learned from living in Poland? Uh, well, it really gave me an opportunity to to go into different areas of business. I mean, I, I, I went over there as a real estate guy. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up opening a, a nightclub and a bomb shelter, which um, the business plan was basically to meet Polish women and drink for free. Okay, um, it, I, it, I, I like that business plan. Yeah. It, it was a very, very clear uh, plan and it had the <laughs> unintended consequence of actually making a lot of money. So I thought, well, there's clearly um, discretionary income here to be um, tapped into. And so I pivoted out of real estate and, and started a company called Atomic Entertainment, which was um, basically food, beverage, media, um, any kind of lifestyle entertainment that we thought the market was hungry for, we would take a swing at. So basically what people enjoy doing when they're not pushing paper, you know, drinking, going out, eating, that was your bread and butter. Yeah, what a, what a keen insight. People like to have fun. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and there was a dearth of it. So um, the the nightclub was uh, the start of that, 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 that spiraled into other things like multiplex cinemas, bowling, bowling alleys, uh, music television channel, and a bunch of other sundry businesses. Wow. So then what, you, you came back to the States. Was it what, what year were you here full time again? So I, I was in Warsaw from, let's say, January of 90 to about 2000. Um, moved, oh, wow. to Par moved to Paris. Um, I spent five years living in France. And um, I thought I would uh, unplug for a little while. That lasted about 10 minutes, and I got really bored. So I, I um, started working with a company called Omnicom, a large uh, 
agency holding business and marketing communications to do acquisitions for them globally. So again, it was a sector I knew little about, but um, was able to quickly understand what made a good agency. And so I, I want to, I'm curious. So it's a sector you knew a little about, but they hired you. What do you do at the, like, I, I mean, you, you have the charisma of a cult leader, I guess. Like how, how do you get people to, uh, to trust you so much? Uh, well, I think it was probably someone there had a good insight. Um, you're buying businesses from entrepreneurs, right? So being an entrepreneur made it a much easier sell, right? I, I okay. wasn't, I wasn't, um, you know, the big corporate guy. I could come in. They said, I, we need a sports agency in India. Go find us one. Um, I could find it, meet with them, understood how they thought, and was able to get to a place where I said, listen, if you, if you want to take some chips off the table, this is a company to sell to because they don't want to run your company. <laughs> they really don't. So you will stay in charge of your own destiny. If you want to walk away, you, they'll buy 100%. If they want a minority partner, uh, there's not a better partner to work with. And we bought 35 agencies globally in five years. Um, I would say the, the founders of, of every one of those agencies has remained a, a close personal friend today. Wow. So you, you, you've built your reputation uh, throughout the years. I, I'd like to get your thoughts on what are some of the the bigger business differences from transacting in Europe versus America? Hmm. Well, it's a tough one, and it certainly varies country by country, right? So, um, you mean Europe isn't just one monolith? Like there's, yeah. there's differences? <laughs> yeah, I have so much to learn, Mark. Ma massive, massive differences. I don't, I don't know it's interesting. I mean, I found like, um, I, again, I can't say this is universally true. My, my personal experience, uh, I found us to like the American mindset to be probably more similar to, let's say, the German mindset in a lot of respects than the French or the English, for example. Um, but like, you know, everything from socially where humor plays more than others, <laughs> right? And if you know, and by the way, humor doesn't translate so well. So that that was a oh, I, I've put my foot in my mouth several times, yeah, oh. and not just within the United States, but go go ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it, again, you're the, the constant theme there, though, were people that were entrepreneurs who built successful businesses in a creative marketplace. So if you're um, the kind of agencies that I was tasked with buying were um, called experiential marketing, the term that we use now. But at the time, I don't, I, it was basically everything below the line of traditional advertising. Now that's where brands are spending most of their, their marketing dollars. So engaging with consumers in places that intersect with their passions. So sports, music, mm -hmm. uh, field marketing activities, that type of thing. Um, so you're meeting really interesting people with great clients and doing fun, creative things. So it was, a, it was a really fun place to learn. And I, through osmosis, got to learn a lot about marketing and, and advertising, which then helped when I got into starting my own uh, CPG businesses. Yeah, what do you think are some of the greatest misconceptions about advertising? Oh my gosh! Um, well, there's that old adage that you know, fifty percent of all advertising is a waste, but fifty <laughs> percent, um, and it's true. I mean, you got to throw. You, you kind of take a shotgun approach, or the traditionally people did, and hope that they were at least hitting part of the target. And I think it's gotten a lot more um, defined in a lot of respects. So that kind of experiential marketing, which embraces everything from field to social media, um, has really become a lot more scientific than it was in the day when I was buying agencies. But uh, So you're not just flipping coins and rolling dice? There, there's uh, number crunching there's behind it? There's still a good amount of that. But um, thank God. I, I think when you see some of the more interesting brands that are out there and, and how they are, get built and how quickly sometimes they build, it's fascinating. I mean, I, Liquid Death, I, I love that brand. And I'm, I'm just amazed that in a, in a place where there's, I don't know, hundreds of bottles of water, how do you come up <laughs> with new water and take market share like no one? And well, you put a name on it that sounds edgy and makes drinking water cool for a target market that, you know, 
why would you why would you drink anything else than, other than liquid death yeah i mean i i drink eight glasses of liquid death a day if i if i can it's it's really a a brilliant case study and uh i have some friends that have gone over to work with them and follow them on social media and every time i see a new activation i'm like that's just genius it's so on brand and mm -hmm. um and and the, the market's rewarding them they're growing in leaps and bounds Nice. Well, speaking of you know edgy names, you founded Atomic Entertainment Group, and you you touched on it uh, moments ago. But what's the story there? Uh, well, the story was that I was looking for a, um, a a client of ours that was going to be one of our anchor tenants in Warsaw, a bank, okay. and they wanted a retail banking facility. And literally, you know, you you had to go knock on doors and walk into buildings and with a translator and try to find space. It wasn't like there was an efficient marketplace. <laughs> uh, so, uh, one uh, the CEO of one of these uh, state-owned companies said, "Oh, we've got great bank space. Let me show you." And takes me downstairs, down dark staircase to a basement, to a lower basement, to a lower basement. <laughs> You're like, are we going to stop soon? <laughs> I, I don't want. I don't want to be rude. Thinking this, is, maybe he didn't understand what I meant by re retail bank. Um, and <laughs> this giant switch, and these lights flicker on, and there's this massive domed room, three levels below ground, that was a bomb shelter. That was where the communist elite were going to survive the nuclear holocaust should it come, and. I want to say this is not going to work for the bank, but the first thing out of my mouth was, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> like uh, the chance to work in a bomb shelter is too good to pass up. That's right. And they immediately thought this would be the most amazing nightclub. And so I ended up leasing the space and opened up a, a club there, which we called Ground Zero, um, obviously. <laughs> playing off of the, the uh, lineage of, of, the, of the venue. Um, and let me tell you, trying to renovate a bomb shelter is maybe the most daunting task you'll ever come across. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know many people have done that. In those walls, I can tell you. <laughs> so you, you're opening up nightclubs that used to be bomb shelters in Warsaw. And uh, I, I read it in your bio, you own several clubs and brands you know throughout the united states when when did you start making investments back here again uh, i came back to the us in 2005 and um was still doing the acquisitions for uh, for Omnicom and, and knowing when the shit hit the fan, uh -huh. nobody was selling their businesses and no one was buying them, uh, just trying to keep their, their head below the parapet. So I figured it was a great time to get back into real estate, buying distressed property. Mm -hmm. So um, I was looking at um, a couple of these neighborhoods uh, and, and being very focused. So River North was one and um, uh, even through 08 and 09, people still went out and still needed to go out, but they were sure. spending less, but they were still be on the street. So yeah. I was converting some of these smaller three-story buildings into single-user restaurant um, spaces or bars. Um, and the market came back with a vengeance, and uh, I got priced out by, by bigger players in, in River North. So I said, well, let's cross the river a mile up the road and go to the West Loop, which was the meatpacking district in Chicago. And, um, there was, you know, there are pallets of poultry and meat being wheeled through the streets and it stank and uh, <laughs> a lot of fallow real estate. I'm thinking, Jesus, we're like, I, I literally just walked about four blocks and it's a whole different world. Um, the glamorous world of private equity folks. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so I was able to find an entire city block that was for sale. The problem was there weren't any banks lending and there weren't any tenants interested. Um, so I figured if I became Details. a tenant, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Um, but I could um, get an SBA loan if it was owner-occupied. So I came back with a plan to occupy 60% of the building with a, a large event space, a craft distillery, and a restaurant. Um, we opened up the event space and the restaurant, the distillery we couldn't get approved. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about distilleries, but it is a class A flammable liquid at the end of the day. Um, uh -huh. So yes. they, the requirements to have them, particularly in Chicago, are very, very stringent. Uh, I think people often conflate um, warehouse fires with distillery fires. Stills don't typically 
blow up. Maybe if you made one on your own in your basement or your garage, it might be a little, it could be prone to uh, some catastrophe, but um, we didn't get it approved. So in the end, we ended up converting the rest of the, the building to office use. And um, lo and behold, uh, there was a, a migration of um, office tenants that want a creative office space that moved from even, well, at the time from River North, but you saw a lot of starting to come from even um, the loop. And, you know, today in the West Loop, you've got Google's headquarters for Chicago, McDonald's. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible that the number of blue chip tenants that have moved into that market because they wanted a different type of uh, environment. And it's, it's, it's been an incredible ride. In, in 10 years, the gentrification of that neighborhood is unparalleled. Mm -hmm. So you, you went to an area that was largely overlooked by many, and now it's, it's all hip, and these, these Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 companies uh, have offices there. Um, and, and recently, you know, we've been through the, the depths of a pandemic. What did like the, the you know, COVID pandemic do to your business, Mark? Well, before I answer that, I should hasten to say that the event space did great and the restaurant was a spectacular failure. Okay. <laughs> Let the record state. Let yes, the record show. Yeah. Uh, so there were some lessons learned. Uh, the, you know, people will go out of their way for a private event, maybe not so much for a restaurant unless it's really exceptional. Okay. So uh, we, we weren't making a big bet on, on the restaurant being exceptional. <laughs> it was a placeholder. <laughs> so yeah. that didn't work so well. Um, but what happened over the uh, ensuing years was that you saw office buildings, residential towers, hotels spring up where there used to be um, meat processing factories. And uh, there became a, a population base that could support restaurants in that neighborhood. Um, through COVID, uh, I would say more lucky than smart, um, one of the venues we opened had a 16,000 square foot outdoor patio. And when they banned indoor dining, Chicagoans being hearty people and, and heavy drinkers, said, yeah, no, right. we're not, yeah. not going to let freezing weather stop us. Um, so no. we just happened to have the biggest outdoor space available for a period where people couldn't go indoors. And we would do five or 600 covers a day in the dead of winter of people huddled under heat lamps, um, enjoying their, their beer or their, their whiskey. So... Uh, we weathered that storm. Um, the the earlier place I mentioned, Untitled, which is an 18,000 square foot venue, um, we decided the, the day they closed indoor dining, I was like, great, we're going to renovate the place because we don't know how long we'll have to be closed. Let's make hay while the sun shines. Mm -hmm. So I spent the better part of a year um, giving it a complete makeover. This is our 10th year of Untitled being in business. So you know, took advantage of it. Um, we we're able to keep our employees um, by, by virtue of PPP funding and uh, reopened when when we were able to, and it's doing great. USA, USA. That yes. makes me so happy to hear. So it, it sounds, Mark, like every investment you've made has been successful, maybe except for that the restaurant. I mean, do, you, do you have any... Uh, learning experiences you can share with us oh gosh you know I, we could do a whole separate podcast on failures um, <laughs> that would be a good well but let's tease it now yeah. let's tease it yeah well no there's plenty of them and i frankly i find stories of people's failures are a lot more interesting than the su su success stories uh no i tried i i had a venture in the on the baltics in poland and um a town called Sopot between Gdansk and Gdynia. Uh, that was a big miss. Um, you know, a beach club in a country that is known for its cold winters. Uh, was you were thinking outside the box. Really creative. You know, I was expecting global warming to happen a lot faster. <laughs> You're like, hurry up, uh, hurry up. <laughs> no, it, it was a seasonal venue, but there were, it was it was fraught with, um, with other issues. Um, you know, a rollout of our entertainment centers in, across uh, Central and Eastern Europe was very complicated just because they're, they're complicated businesses and they were um, big box format. Okay. Uh, so some were successful and some weren't. And 
learned that I, I don't want to have another rollout strategy ever again. I'm, I like being more opportunistic. So, you know, you, you see you see an opportunity where there's white space and 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 capitalize on a, with the right concept for that location. Um, mm -hmm. I like that approach better. Nice. And then mentally, what what keeps you um, from getting you know down in the dumps and and you know take deciding all right the, the, you know I've, I've lost money on this deal i just want to throw in the towel what, what motivates you to keep going yeah um well i think learning from your mistakes and trying not to repeat them is a good a good start uh mm -hmm. you know looking back and saying why did i fail is um i think people don't often i think scrutinize that enough and um you know i i I think I haven't repeated too many mistakes. We'll see. Um, but also keeping a lot of plates spinning. I, maybe it's part of being ADHD is, you know, having <laughs> lots of interesting things going on at once um, that I can kind of pivot towards what may be more interesting or seems to be uh, more rewarding at, at that time. Um, so I, I got into spirits by happenstance and uh, discovered I love that that sector and there's a lot of creativity there's um you have to be fairly numerate yeah cap it's a, can be a very capital intensive business and raising capital is a big part of my business mm -hmm. uh, and was fortunate to be successful with the the first brand uh, which was a, a brand called angels envy and just happened to come out with a, a really good product with a unique brand positioning at a time where people started getting interested in craft cocktails and 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 brown spirits again so mm -hmm. um it worked well, and and after the sale of that company, uh, created a company called SIP Spirit Investment Partners to make early stage investments in spirits and and to create our own brands in the space. Aptly uh, named. So uh, yeah, one of my favorite songs, Mark, is "Knocking on Heaven's Door," and you're part of Heaven's Door Whiskey. How did that come about? Um, well, interesting story there. Uh, I had read in, in an industry publication that Bob Dylan had filed a trademark registration for a brand called Bootleg Whiskey. And uh, as a Dylan fan, I was amazed that he would want to own anything, first and foremost. And then secondly, like, well, does he know anything about whiskey? How is he going to do this? <laughs> Who's he partnering with? I can't believe this. Is, you know, so I, I obsessed over this. And um I, I got in touch with his manager. Um, uh, I was rather relentless uh, and was able to get a, uh, an audience with Jeff Rosen, who's managed Bob for, I don't know, 40 years, and discovered that um, Bob has lots of ideas and he's, he's in, in a ton of interest. And this was one of them. And Jeff said, you know, he, sometimes he, you know, is hot on something for a while and cools on it, but this has been something he's been on me for for a long time so i, I filed the trademark registration because he, he loves the name bootleg whiskey but honestly i don't know how we're going to go about building this mm -hmm. company i said well can i throw some ideas at you <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, lend me your ear <laughs> sure exactly um so over a very short period of time and some conversations with them came back with some thoughts and said you know this are just idea starters but you know, I think it's awfully, it would be awfully cliche to kind of focus on Dylan and his music career. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there may be a more interesting approach would be to look at, to see him through a different lens and where he's not the brand, but a hero behind the brand. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeff had told me that Bob was a very accomplished painter and also um, sculpted uh, with metal. And when I saw the stuff he was producing, I was blown away. And I, I consider myself a, a big fan and lots of friends who also would, would say the same. And no one knew that he was an artist, a visual artist. Yeah. So we thought that was a really interesting place to kind of focus the brand. So the positioning was um, kind of the melding of art and craft. So the bottle designs are adorned with his metal sculptures, uh, very kind of steampunk um, quality to them. So he has these pickers that go around the country to scrap yards and farms and find cool shit and <laughs> load up their truck and they bring them back to his his studio in California called Bat, uh, Black Buffalo Ironworks. And he's got these bins of weather vanes and gears and pitchforks and yeah, all kinds of interesting <laughs> things. And he comes in and he 
puts stuff on the floor and he comes up with this, these ideas, these images in his head and welds these things together into these gates. But that would be a really cool um, kind of graphic for our bottles. Yeah. So we presented some concepts with uh, both his paintings and with the metal gates as, um, as the decoration and uh, Bob loved them, which uh, I, I thought was kind of risky because sometimes putting your, you know, a painting of yours onto a bottle of booze might be offensive to some. Yeah, are you um, overly commercializing your art? Right, yeah, um, but Bob, Bob thought it was really cool and came back and said, well, would you consider some name exploration? Uh, I, I get the bootleg reference to the albums, but bootleg whiskey is moonshine and uh, I don't suppose yeah. that's really what we want to be marketing. Um, there's a lot of other names that I think could be interesting. And said, well, give us your ideas. And, you know, that was a fun exercise because you look at album names and nicknames, and song titles and other references. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that really just jumped out was Heaven's Door. And I, I felt like without being overly overt, um, it stood on its own as the name of a whiskey brand. And mm -hmm. it was a nice nod and a wink to Dylan. Uh, sure. And there was no, nothing on the bottle that suggested that Bob was involved, um, other than a little neck tag that hung on it. That there's a picture of a guy with a welding mask down. Okay. And if you open the neck tag, the mask is up, and you, you recognize it's Bob Dylan. And if you were really interested, you could read that the, he created the, the um, artwork that's on the bottle. Um, so it was, it was interesting, because I'd asked if we could have his signature on the bottle, and, and Jeff said, there's no chance. I'm like, really? It's, I mean, it's Bob's brand. He goes, he didn't put his name on his albums from 1966 to 1972. He's not putting it on his bottle of whiskey. <laughs> so, well, and why is that? I'm just curious. I, you know, why does Bob do what? <laughs> I, I don't know. That, I don't know. I'm not sure anyone can really answer that with, with authority. Getting um, in the mind of a rock star. Yeah. All right. Um, but I was able to persuade him to put his signature on the inside of the front label. So if okay. you finish the bottle and you really were looking, you would see that his <laughs> signature is on the, is the back of the front label. If you're like, and I'm seeing something. It might be a signature of Bob maybe, Dylan. But maybe, maybe I should have drank the whole bottle. <laughs> um, but I say, listen, you, artists often sign the back of their paintings. This is kind of the same thing. And um, that, you know, that, that resonated. And so that's the, the full extent of his, let's call it his, uh, his personal exposure on the brand. But Bob loves the loves the whiskey. He's very involved in in all of the taste profiles, and um, you know he's got a, a, an incredible eye. So anything that we do that's uh, design related, uh, there's a lot of input. Yeah. So I mean, Mark, beverages are ridiculously competitive. I mean, you had this wonderful idea. You have a cool name. I mean, the product can be badass. But if it's not implemented properly, no one's going to know about it. You know, you can lose money. So where do you go from creating this idea to making it a commercial success? How does that work? And I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it helps to a large extent that you have a globally renowned celebrity. Um, but that also, that's a double-edged sword, right? right? Particularly when... There's a lot of celebrity vodkas or, or you know, drinks oh, yeah. out there. Vodka, tequila, gin, you, you name it. Um, certainly a lot more today than there were when we started five years ago. Uh, but we, you know, our, our insight was that Dylan fans would, um, could be skeptical and say, well, you know, why did he sell out? Is this a license deal? Or, you know, just, just downright incredulous. Yeah. And, and whiskey files would be incredulous that it could be good product. Sure. So, oh, it's another celebrity washing of a brand. Yeah. And so on. so our, our focus was that it has to be all about the liquid. It has to be vetted by hardcore whiskey aficionados. And if they say this is great juice, then others will, will buy in. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a ton of time on, on the liquid development and barrel finishing and blending and, and coming up with stuff that not only was outstanding, but unique. And we, everything that we talked about for the first four years of being in market was about the liquid and very little mention and certainly no visual identification with, with Bob himself. And so the, 
the, you know, the brand has won just about every award um, that you can win. And so I think, certainly think it's been vetted as, as great whiskey. Um, so kind of the, the next phase of, of that brand building is, is more on the emotional brand building side we talked about earlier is what makes you, what makes it sticky? What makes it resonate with you when you've got 500 other choices in the, in the whiskey mm-hmm. aisle? And to a large extent, it's not just the quality of the liquid, but it's how it makes you feel. That's why we buy what we buy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of the, the next phase of, of our, our brand journey is, is more of those, um, let's call them emotional components that make uh, a brand interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think emotional components is everything when it comes to kind of consumable products. You know, you're, you're not buying a house. You're, you're, you're selling an experience. That's uh, right. There's, there's utility, uh, and then there's, there's the emotional component. So why do, you, why do you buy the bottle of vodka you buy? It's, it's, it's still ethanol. It's an right. old tasteless <laughs> spirit. But you'll pay twice the price for one bottle of ethanol versus the other for a reason, and that is an emotional reason. Yeah, because one you remember from, you know, maybe it's a time in Warsaw or, you know, your first legal drink or your first time you got dumped and this bottle helped you get through it. So there, there are lot, lots of reasons we, we go back to the old staples. So this was a big hit and, uh, you know, it was a hit in a competitive space. And, and you've done a lot of very impressive things during your career, Mark. What are some of the achievements you're most proud of? Oh, for without question, my family. Um Four children, uh, all wow. amazing individuals. Uh, could not they could not be more different from each other, which is uh, always fun as a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, as they're young adults, they're they they become um, not just your kids but your friends at a whole different level. So I I, I put family above everything else. Um, you know, I, I quite enjoy the creative process of any business, whether it's the you know renovating of a warehouse or a, a restaurant or the spirit space. Um, that's, I think that's the fun part. And you, you hope you're, that it gets acceptance because people like the creative creativity as well. Um, it's not always the case, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that being able to do things that are, um, that are fun, uh, gives you the energy to go out and fight the fight every day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you, you seem to have a lot of energy. Uh, you know, I'm asking you to look at your crystal ball a little bit, but where do you see the, the future of beverages? Uh yeah, well, obviously the in alcohol beverage, the biggest um, I would say threat or perceived threat has been legalization of marijuana and cannabis. Mm-hmm. And Certainly, you see a lot of consumer trends that say those concerns are well founded. Um, it's no longer taboo in most social circles for people to have a gummy or some other in some other deliverable um, right. in social settings, and that uh, usually curtails the amount they would consume in, in beverages, whether it's beer, wine, or spirits. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see the impact and how that plays out over time. Um, you're seeing already uh, non-elk and low-elk beverages on the rise. Yeah, white claws are popular at the moment. Yeah, right. And then, of course, that that I think comes more from people's uh, concern over calorie count more than anything. Uh, I don't think that five, six years ago, people expected that there would be a huge swath of the male population that switched from craft beer to uh, <laughs> to seltzers. I wouldn't have bet on it. Yeah. Who would have thunk, right? Yeah. I mean, we have to remember, I'm, I'm a little older than you are, but uh, Zumo was... Uh, in Zuma, oh, yeah, I remember. It well, yeah, it was, right? it was a, yeah. the drink of choice for high schoolers and uh, sorority girls. Yeah. Ex- exactly. And, and you know, it, it, I, it, it spiked and died a quick death, I think. Um, but a lot of RTDs are malt-based today, and, and the category is on fire. Um, you know, a little different taste profile, a lot different marketing, but... Um, it's an interesting, a very interesting category. But I don't, I don't think that um, high-end spirits is not going away anytime soon. <laughs> no. And I, I think super, in the super premium and ultra premium category, uh, that's really where the, the long-term opportunities remain. What advice do you have for people looking to get into either private equity or food and entertainment? Oh, boy. Uh, well, anyone who wants to get in the restaurant business should um, get counseling. 
but it, it, it is a labor of love for sure. Um, and I, I think it's the highest failure rate of any business sector that I certainly that I know of. So it's tricky, um, but it is fun and rewarding. And in beverage, we see a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, people that come from all walks of life who give up their well-paying day job because they're passionate about fill in the blank tequila to Malort. And you're like, well, um, usually the biggest obstacle is maybe underestimating the capital required to really build a brand. So if, if you're going to bootstrap it and you're getting into this space for the first time, just staying local and staying small versus mm -hmm. trying to grow too fast is really key. Win in your own backyard. And mm -hmm. when you've made all the mistakes that you could possibly make and you survive them uh, and you've course corrected, then you start thinking about expansion. Look at that. Bloom where you're planted, but kids, that's, that's good advice. Uh, whether it's business or life, uh, what are you most optimistic about, Mark? Hmm. Uh, well, I guess I, I'd like to think I'm optimistic about life generally. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm focused on a project right now, which is kind of a melding of the three areas that we've talked about. So um, doing a resort development, which is tapping into a lot of trends right now, which is kind of destination, low density, uh, health and well-being focused. Um, you know, I think during COVID, we learned that not only were hotels closed, but when they reopened, you really want to be riding an elevator on a 30-story you know, building, um, or do you want to maybe get in the car and go for a two hour drive to a place where you can go for long walks and stay in your mm -hmm. own cabin. Um, and there's, so there was already a trend towards that before COVID. I think there's going to be a long, long tail for more experience driven, um, type of hospitality. So the project that I'm working on really is kind of the amalgamation of those aspects. So health and wellness, uh, design driven, gastronomy driven um, in a remarkable environment. Um, so 600 acres of, of prairie land uh, just on the Illinois Wisconsin border. So that's a it's it's a big project and it's it's nice because it will have a, a long kind of uh, phased approach. So I think that'll keep me busy for uh, in, until I'm completely gray. Uh, I, I, I want to check this out. Uh, so people out there who want, want to learn more about what you're up to, or maybe they just want to, you know, educate themselves, where where can they go? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. I, don't, I, I guess we have some websites. Um, <laughs> well, leave, Mark's a busy guy. Leave him alone. But, you know, we, we, we can link to your websites if, if, you, if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not hard to find. Um, so my the private equity group is called MAB Capital Management. Uh, Atomic Entertainment or Atomic Hospitality is our food and beverage group. And Spirit Investment Partners or SIP is the spirits group. And uh, love talking with entrepreneurs, uh, love paying it forward. And uh, so I'd be happy to speak with anybody who happened to be listening. Well, millions of people are listening. So, you know, get, get in get while you can. Hundreds of millions. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Matt, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it.